Soldiers of the Infinite, welcome to Ren Shen Half Spirit, Chapter 9. <laughs> Stephen Megumi stayed in the Higashiyama district of Kyoto. It was the ancient capital of Japan and the historical buildings fascinated Steve. They visited many temples and Steve was eager to learn about the symbolism of many of the statues. Some depicted a peaceful Buddha, while others portrayed utterly frightening characters. He particularly liked the pairs of statues called Nio or Kongori Kishi, one always with its mouth open and the other with the mouth closed one carrying a thunderbolt, the other carrying a sabre. They were fierce looking warriors or kings or even gods whose job was to protect Buddha. And even though Buddha was a pacifist, these mythical creatures were apparently justified to help guard against evil and protect cherished values. Steve remembered Megumi saying her father would have died a million deaths if she married under the Buddhist faith. He asked her what his problem was with the religion. Megumi said, I don't know the full story, and maybe I never will, but my father blames Buddhism for his suffering. I don't know what he is suffering from. He's extremely wealthy and has whatever he wants. I really don't know, but I was always told as a child the Buddhists caused our family to suffer great loss and that Buddhism was a curse to our family line. It means nothing to me and I couldn't care less. I still take comfort in praying to Buddha. I feel sick talking about him though. Enough about him, please. Steve noticed Megumi physically reacting to the mere mention of her father. She would sometimes rock herself slightly to cover the trembling. Steve found it very distressing to see his wife like that. He hugged his sweet love tightly and thought to himself, that bastard made my poor baby a wreck. Anyway, how can a religion be the enemy of a man? I can understand why people can become enemies using religion as an excuse, but how on earth could a religion be the man's personal enemy? too strange. Their honeymoon was over and it was time to return to Tokyo. Steve was already thinking about how they might resolve Tanya's problem. Megumi thought they might negotiate with that animal, Sammy Black Eyes, and try to reduce Tanya's debt to a more reasonable amount. Steve was of the opinion that a monster like him wouldn't negotiate one bit and that trouble would be imminent. They used the new fast train to reach Tokyo in record time and reach their apartment in only a few hours. Something was wrong. The door lock was broken and it was wide open. There were signs of struggle and Tanya was clearly gone. Megumi checked with neighbours and nobody saw or admitted to seeing anything. Steve went straight to Uncle Tucky's dojo. Steve was naturally very worried about Tanya, but as he was running to the dojo, he began to wonder if anything had also happened to Uncle Tucky. To his relief, Uncle Tucky was fine. He was teaching a class and his delight upon Steve quickly faded when he observed the concerned expression on his face. Steve told Uncle Tucky what their apartment looked like and they both quickly came to the same conclusion. They were sure that Sammy Black Eyes had taken her. Uncle Tucky had checked on her the previous evening and she looked well rested and happy. He was extremely upset with himself and he'd been due to go back to the apartment after his karate class. It was afternoon and too early to go to the club. Uncle Tucky said he knew one of the young lads from the club where Tanya worked. He'd been a student of Uncle Tucky's when he was younger and always showed honour to his former sensei. He'd find him and try to find where Sammy Black Eyes lived. Steve was grateful and went back to the apartment to see if Megumi had learned anything. Steve found Megumi extremely emotional and crying in the apartment. She said, We shouldn't have left her alone. Did you find out anything? Please tell me, is Uncle Tucky okay? Steve consoled her and told her that Uncle Tucky was fine and had gone to see one of his former students who worked at the club. Megumi told Steve, you don't understand my baby love. That man is under my father's control. If he's taken Tanya to Okinawa, then she will never return. Uncle Taki eventually arrived at the apartment. I'm going back to Okinawa, he said. He's already there with Tanya. They are in my home city. I will fix this. You must stay here. Megumi, you remember what you were like back home. Stay away from your father. You must not return. Megumi replied, Uncle Taki, you must not go alone. I'm better now. You know my father does not hurt you here because I'm in your care. If you go there, we cannot be sure. I must come with you. Steve, my love, please stay here. 
You do not want to meet my father. Trust me. Steve spoke with emotion. My baby love. You're my wife and our life is one. If I don't go with you and something happens, I'll never recover. There's no choice for me. If you must go, then we all must go. Hurry. There's no time to waste. Steve's unshakable resolve made it clear there was going to be no room for negotiation. Steve and Megumi already had their toiletries packed from their honeymoon. They replaced a few clothes in their luggage and Steve took what seemed to be a distant memory for him, the letter from Sensei Mike to his own Sensei. Later that afternoon, the three of them were on a flight to Naha, Okinawa. Steve was surprised how far Okinawa was from Tokyo. It was in the middle of the East China Sea and looked almost as close to China as it was to mainland or Naichi, Japan, where Tokyo is situated. The weather in Tokyo had begun to cool down and Steve was surprised to feel the abrupt change into a much warmer climate upon their arrival. Uncle Tucky still had a small home in Naha. It was just down the road from his sensei's dojo and would be a good place to leave their luggage whilst they looked for Tanya. They grabbed a cab and made their way to Uncle Tucky's home. Steve noticed a number of small stone tablets or monuments with characters carved on them. They were curiously located at the end of forked roads or T-intersections. Upon asking Megumi about their significance, the cab driver interrupted the conversation, saying, They are the Ishiganto. They are named after a heroic Chinese general in the service of a god who was able to catch and remove evil spirits. They are placed in these locations because it is known the evil spirits can only attack in straight lines. The Ishiganto stones will either kill the evil spirits or at least deflect them. You will see them everywhere here. They are our evil spirits defense system, he said. Megumi and Uncle Taki just nodded in confirmation as though to confirm another very normal aspect of life in Okinawa. After what Steve had already witnessed in his life, he decided it would be wise to learn as much as possible about how the Okinawans dealt with matters pertaining to supernatural forces. Megumi was not feeling well. So Steve suggested she take a rest. It was a stressful day and neither of them had a single moment to collect their thoughts. Uncle Taki wanted to check on his sensei as he was aware his health had been deteriorating and there was also a chance he might know more about Sammy Black Eye's movements in Okinawa. Steve asked Uncle Taki if it was okay to go with him. Uncle Taki said, I was hoping you would want to come with me, but please remember, Sensei has not been himself for a long time. Do not judge him now. He was once a great man and the greatest sensei. The dojo was only a short walk from Uncle Tucky's home. The building looked quite historic and flanking the gated entrance were two statues resembling lions, one with its mouth open and the other closed. Steve noticed the similarity with the Neo statues he saw in Kyoto. The mouth formations and the location near the entrance was a recurring theme. He asked Uncle Tucky what they were. He said, they are the Shisa. Lion dog creatures who fight evil spirits away and help keep good spirits in. You'll see them everywhere in Okinawa. Our legends say the Gana Mui woods were created when a tiny shisa roared at a dragon and a boulder fell from the heavens to kill it. The smallest shisa can kill the greatest enemy. Do not confuse Okinawa with other places in Japan. Our history is unique and our influences and relationships with neighbouring countries are long and enduring. We are Rukyu, we are Japanese, but we also know China very well. As Steve passed the Shisa, he could have sworn they moved. He was a little weary after a full day of travelling all over Japan and decided his mind was playing tricks with him. He liked the lions and decided to himself the Shisa would have to be friends with a Macedonian. Uncle Taki said, this is not how the dojo from my youth looked. It used to be so clean and tranquil here. It's a mess. They both bowed as they entered the dojo and it was immediately obvious nobody had trained there in a long time. The floor was dusty and the training equipment was strewn all over the space. Uncle Tucky called out to ask if anyone was there. Steve remained near the entrance while Uncle Tucky looked for his sensei. They heard some shouting at the back of the dojo and both went out to investigate. It was sensei. He was submerged in the unruly gardens and shouting. He looked as though he was pushing away invisible adversaries. Uncle Taki called out his name and he didn't respond. He shouted louder the second time. Nakandari Sensei, your loyal student Oshiro Takeshi has returned to see you. Finally, he looked up. Uncle Taki appeared thankful he had managed to attract Sensei's attention. He's so old, Steve thought. 
Sensei was a short and stout old man. He looked weary and had unkempt hair and filthy clothing. His movements seemed unstable and he was mumbling some incomprehensible words. Steve felt embarrassed to see Sensei Mike's great sensei in such a disheveled state. He bowed his head deeply to express a greeting, but more importantly, to suggest he had not seen the man's obvious shortcomings. By the time Steve had raised his head with uncanny dexterity, the sensei was right next to him, clutching his arm. Uncle Tucky tried to conduct a formal greeting, but the sensei quickly interrupted. Ah, Tucky, who is this shining light? Who have you brought to me? I can feel him. So good. Uncle Tucky said, Nakandari Kiyoshi, Nakandari Sensei. Please allow me to introduce Steve Nedelkin, a true son of Goju-Ru and former student of Honorable Mike Ferguson. I can attest to... Nakandari Sensei interrupted him with surprising clarity and calm. Steve Nedelkin, it is my honor to meet you. Please excuse the mess in and around my dojo. I have not been quite myself for a number of years now. Your presence is deeply comforting to me. You have a way with demons. You have fought them and won. I feel it. Such a sweet energy about you. Please tell me more about you, Steve Nadelkin. I'm blessed to be in your presence. Steve was speechless. He used the Okinawan dialect to greet the sensei. Honorable Nakandari sensei, I'm not the man you think I am. It is my hope to learn from you. Sensei Mike praised you every day of my instruction with him. And uncle, I mean Sensei Taki, also has praised you as a teacher and a great man. It would be an honor if you allowed me to be a student of yours one day. Nakandari Sensei said, Nonsense. You have more to teach me than I can teach you. Your presence has overwhelmed the evil which is presently torturing my spirit. I need to spend time with you and learn from you. Uncle Taki was flabbergasted. He hadn't seen Sensei with such clarity for many years and certainly never observed him display such a degree of deference to anyone before, much less a young aspiring student such as Steve. Sensei turned to Uncle Taki and said, Thank you, Taki-san. You have always been a faithful student and teacher. Now you have brought hope to me in my darkest of times. Uncle Taki was utterly confused. Perhaps he wasn't seeing something which was perfectly obvious to his sensei. Or perhaps his sensei was even more crazy than when he left him a few years ago. But he had remarkable clarity, Uncle Taki thought to himself. Uncle Taki went on to explain the main reason why they arrived in Okinawa, how they had to find Sammy Black Eyes and rescue their friend Tanya. Sensei said, oh yes, they brought you here then. Why do they want Steve here? Uncle Taki thought his sensei misunderstood. No, no, we came here to help a girl who was kidnapped. Steve's wife, Megumi, is her closest friend, he said. Sensei Kiyoshi exclaimed. Your Megumi? That monster's Megumi? Oh, Taki, you were brought to him at the click of his fingers. How willingly you have returned to the spider's web. Uncle Taki was instantly ashamed of his naivety. Of course, Sensei, how could I have been so foolish? It has nothing to do with the girl. He wanted Megumi here. Steve interjected, who wanted her here? Sensei and Uncle Taki responded in unison, Kumicho. Steve apologized to them both for the inconvenience of the entire situation and said he needed to go and warn Megumi. Sensei asked Steve, must you go? I've enjoyed your presence immensely. Please return as soon as you can. Steve sprinted out of the dojo and instinctively gave one of the shisa a little pat on the way out. He could have sworn the statue felt more like a real creature than a piece of stone. As soon as Steve left, Sensei's thoughts seemed to wander, and he became less coherent. Uncle Taki swept the dojo and left soon after. As he was leaving, he could hear his Sensei laughing maniacally and talking to what looked like invisible assailants. You'll see. Back to your darkness you will go. Not a moment too soon. His unsettling laugh reverberated through the dojo. Steve arrived back at Uncle Taki's apartment and was pleased to see Megumi looked much better. She told him she'd thrown up earlier but now felt much improved. Megumi seemed to think it may have been the food they had bought at the airport. She prepared a pot of tea for them and Steve told her about the possibility of her father manufacturing the entire situation in order to make her return to Okinawa. Megumi said, of course, 
I knew it was likely. It's why I didn't want you to come. And I couldn't leave Uncle Taki alone. And it still doesn't help Tanya. We still need to get her away from these people. I fear I might have to face my father if we can't get to Tanya quickly. I don't want to ask him for anything. He'll demand too much in return. It had been a long day and Steve was exhausted so decided to rest. He asked Megumi to wake him if Uncle Taki returned. It was a terrible sleep. He kept hearing whispers and movements as though they were just outside his door. He woke to hear Megumi and Uncle Taki quarrelling. Uncle Taki was eager for Megumi and Steve to return to Tokyo and Megumi was not prepared to leave without Tanya. They were at an obvious stalemate when Steve went to calm them down. The next morning Steve woke up early so he and Uncle Taki could visit the dojo. Steve walked past the Shisa and made a point of touching the statue he hadn't touched the previous evening. Again his sensation of touch belied what his eyes were telling him about the stone statues. He knew what stone felt like and the Shissa felt nothing like it, even though that was precisely what they were. Steve and Uncle Taki had developed some routines together which helped them warm up and centre their energy. They went through some two-man training carter and Sensei entered the dojo clapping. He was utterly delighted to see Steve again. He said, wonderful, Sensei Steve has arrived. Steve was embarrassed and reluctant to accept such a title. He politely insisted this was inappropriate and asked if he could show him the letter from Sensei Mike. Sensei read the letter and began to cry. He said, your Sensei Mike was my greatest failure and greatest success. He was one of my best students, but his spirit was damaged in his war. When I tried to save myself from Hiro's gun, I mistakenly summoned Mike's past evils. His beloved Chiasa could not wash away those sins completely, and I made the greatest sin of all. I summoned that power to save myself. And now those lowly demons taunt me. They do not own my spirit yet, but my resolve has been weakening. Until you arrived, young Steve son, my mind is much more clear when you are near me. They refuse to taunt me in your presence. They are with me, but they do not understand you and they fear you. I believe they can be banished with your energy. Tell me, Steve, what is your power? We, I mean, I want to know. No, no, forget it. Do not tell me. You must never tell me. Uncle Tucky glanced at Steve, and while Steve did not return the glance, he felt it. How was Steve to know if this was indeed Nakandari Sensei, or in fact, the demons looking for information? Steve said, Sensei, I have nothing to tell. I'm not aware of any power. I had a great Sensei, and he had the best in you as his Sensei. I was lucky to find such people in my life. If I may, Sensei, I would be honoured if you would allow me to perform a kata for you. Sensei said, I am most eager to see what my student taught you. Please show me, as he clapped his hands with the joy of an eager child. Steve cast a glance at Uncle Taki. They had developed an understanding between each other over the years of training together. One look was often enough to tell an entire story, and it was clear Steve was up to something. Nakandari Sensei, please, I asked my wife to look through the window to watch me perform my kata for you. Would you mind watching my demonstration from near the entrance gates? She will be able to see also. I know it's a silly request, but this is one of the proudest days in my life and I want to share this with my bride. Sensei waved in the general direction of Uncle Taki's home and assured Steve it was fine. Steve called Uncle Taki to join him and said, if I may, I would like him near me so we can also demonstrate our two-man kata. Sensei waved Steve on to proceed. Steve had mastered every kata within his fighting style. He decided to perform tensho, turning palms, a highly advanced kata which resembled the Sun Chin kata but was completely different. It was uniquely Okinawan and represented an evolution in the application of breathing. The way of internalizing the breath was transformative and, if done correctly, was immediately obvious to a master. Steve bowed to his sensei and began the kata. His technique was superb and Uncle Taki had a sense of pride watching Steve perform it to perfection. Halfway through the kata, Steve stomped his foot on the ground and summoned his roar. He hadn't done it for a few years, but it was something he could never forget. His body vibrated and he visualized the energy deep inside himself. Out it came. The lion leapt forward and pounced on Sensei's tortured spirit. Sensei was knocked over by the energy and then what appeared to be black serpentine mists shot out of him. Uncle Tucky ran toward his Sensei, but Steve told him to wait and stay close. 
Then they both watched the legend become reality. As the two nearby Shisa roared and came to life, one launched itself at the black serpents and devoured them all. The other ran to Sensei and fiercely stood guard so none could find their way back inside him. Their job was done. They turned towards Steve and bowed their heads before returning to their locations next to the gate. Steve and Uncle Tucky helped Sensei up. His face had changed. There was a lightness in his eyes and his spirit was liberated. He looked at Steve and said, You summoned the Shissa. I've only read about this in the ancient texts, but you did it. I sensed your power, but I could never have imagined what you were capable of. Thank you, my son. You have rescued me. My spirit is cleansed, and I now truly understand the great shame of my past. I'm deeply indebted to you. Uncle Tucky was amazed and confused. He asked Steve, How could you have possibly believed the Shisa would help you? And what on earth was that lion that shot out of you? Steve smiled, walked over to touch one of them and said, I knew the Shisa would help the moment I touched them. They believed in me, and I believed in them. You need more faith in your Okinawan protectors, Uncle Taki. As for my lion energy, I fear I'll never truly understand it. Nakandari Sensei said, It is your gift, and you used it to help me. I'm grateful, and have learned much about myself, and the ways of the world during my period of torture, and during my salvation. Thank you again, young Steve son. Now please tell me everything. I'm ready to learn again. Steve explained the series of events which led him to Japan. He talked about his bloodline and Sensei Mike, Demon Hiro and the monsters. Sensei was astounded that Steve had managed to expel the demon out of Hiro. He said the demon that entered Hiro was far more powerful than the lonely demon spies that fought for his own spirit. When Steve heard the word spies, he asked Sensei, who were they spying for? Sensei said, here in Japan, they all answer to one your father-in-law. He already feels you, Steve's son. I know this. Sensei was a wealth of knowledge. His years of resistance against the demons gave him a knowledge most humans would never learn. Steve learned there was a hierarchy of demons and the notion that all demons were evil was folly, that even prophets could be understood to be demons in the right context. They are merely familiar conduits through which the gods interact with earth unobtrusively. Their power corrupts them almost every time, and most cannot control their greed for the delights of the mortal world. He learned Kumicho was one of the few, destined for greatness and one of the highest level demons on earth. They can even play the gods against each other, Sensei said. He lies to the gods and they trust him. Such is his way. The moment he bends your will, you're already in his servitude. Your first concession is fuel for the darkness and they are the worst virus. They will consume most men in an instant. Steve said, you talk about gods. I was brought up to believe in one God. Which is it? Sensei replied, who are we to understand gods or God? Whoever he, it or they are is beyond the comprehension of us mortals. How they or it chooses to resonate with mortals is entirely up to the mortals' relationship with them or it or him. A single God can have innumerable thoughts. Each thought can be a God. It doesn't matter to most mortals, Steve's son. You can fill your stomach with ramen or rice. Whichever tastes better to you is fine. The job will be done. God or gods will be the same and can nourish your spirit if you allow yourself. Just please, do not eat junk food. Steve was quite overwhelmed with that answer but had so many more questions. He asked, Megumi said her father carries a sin in his bloodline which had made him evil. But how can evil remain in a bloodline? Megumi has never had an evil thought. Sensei said, there is indeed a stain on their bloodline. Megumi has been wise to stay away from her father. Her physical resistance is a manifestation of her own choice to avoid the darkness. In the beginning and end, Steve's son, it's always a choice between good and evil. But how can I do what I do with that lion energy? Steve asked. Sensei explained. You told me of your royal bloodline. You carry the celestial blood. You also are a conduit for the gods. If you choose to receive them and favour good over evil, you can be a positive force in this world. But it can also corrupt you. 
with nothing more than a single temptation. You could abandon good and embrace evil. It's a dangerous path for someone with your power potential. Just as you harness the shisa with the purity of your heart, you'll be able to do more as you grow to understand your path. You must look beyond this world and embrace the celestial cities. It will come for someone as powerful as you. But you'll need to make a great choice one day. It will not be without sacrifice. Steve thanked Nakandari Sensei for his insight, even though it was difficult to grasp. Uncle Taki was completely out of his league with much of the discussion, but was clearly pleased with Sensei's dramatic recovery. He said, Sensei, you look 20 years younger and the light has returned to your eyes. Steve has been a blessing to both of us. Will you teach me again? Sensei replied, my faithful Taki, my time as a teacher has ended. I'm ready to leave. I want to go to Fujian, China, and seek to restore balance in my spirit. I tried to help people and ended up creating terror. It weighs heavily upon me. I will find those who understand the old ways of the five ancestors. It's the only way I'll find my peace. It has often been the path of Okinawan Goju Ru masters. Sensei looked at Uncle Taki and noticed how fit he looked. He smiled and said, Taki, you have not looked so strong and fit since you were a young man. It would please me if you could demonstrate your kata. Uncle Taki was honored. He performed like the true master he was and Sensei nodded and smiled. He asked them both to return the following morning as he wanted to present them with a few items. Soon he would embark on his journey. My goodness. Oh, wow. Did you see that? Soldiers of the infinite. Good over evil. We can all make a choice. Every day, every minute. What a chapter. We moved from Kyoto back to Tokyo, back to over to Okinawa. Steve met his sensei's sensei. What an honor, what a privilege, but he wasn't ready for the shock, was he? Okay, let's think about this. Where did we start? We came back to find out Tanya had gone, been taken, someone broke in. No one spoke about it in the apartment block. The Japanese tend to keep to themselves on issues like that. All they're going to do is get roped into a very terrible situation with the Yakuza. Best to stay out of things. Found out that he had taken Tan Sammy Black Eyes had taken Tanya to Okinawa. What was the real reason? Perhaps it was to get Megumi back home. Perhaps. Um, so, they're all in Okinawa. Steve, Megumi wasn't feeling too well. She got better, that's good, thankfully. Um, Steve went to meet his sensei's sensei. If you do martial arts, what an honor and a privilege it would be to see the teacher of your teacher, to meet the teacher of your teacher, just to see you know, how they move, what they do. If there was a chance of seeing a technique, you would, you would immediately try to correlate it with how your, your teacher moved. Um, you'd look for everything that joins all of you as a family or as a brotherhood, as a, as a family of martial artists within your style. So you're looking for clues all the time. Um, in fact, any time I see someone who's done a style, a style similar to mine, I look for the things that bind us. I look for the bits that, um, that seem familiar. And then I, I assess whether they look like they know what they're doing, whether it's within the realms, whether it's in the right language. Um, if, if they're using the wrong words, then it's a different language. Um, so the wrong movements, as far as I'm concerned, are a different language. But he didn't get to see anything. He saw Nakandari Sensei. He saw this man a little bit crazed out in the unkempt gardens out the back, fighting invisible opponents, assailants. He was a madman, crazed look in his eyes, crazy. Somehow he latched onto Steve. He could feel it. There was something about Steve. And the demons within him seemed to calm down, give him a clarity of mind 
to be able to engage with, with Steve Nadelkin. Of course, as Steve walked in, he felt those lions, the shisa, which, um, again, coming back to, um, to Okinawa geographically, somewhere in between uh, the main islands of Japan, the Naichi area, which is where Tokyo is situated and Kyoto and all that, um, uh, you've got Okinawa, which is right in the middle between those islands and China, mainland China. Um, so, um, so it's only fair that the influences that come into Okinawa would, would quite easily happen um, through China. The, um, uh, the Celestial Kingdom, or China, uh, the name for China as it used to be, um, refused to trade with anybody outside of China. Um, they made a concession for the Okinawans, the Rukyu people. So in fact, it ended up that Okinawa became a base where other nations planted themselves, we're talking hundreds of years ago, uh, planted themselves because they were desperate to trade with China. A bit different to nowadays where China's selling you everything for three cents and, um, and everyone's buying it and sending all of our money to a to a happy and prosperous or increasingly prosperous mainland China or People's Republic of China. And um, back in those days, they just said, we don't need you. We're not interested. So they had a very closed policy. And um, it was the Okinawans, the Rukyu people, who were the only ones for a long period who were able to trade with the Chinese. And a lot of influence, a lot of cultural influence flowed freely between the two regions. Um, in addition to that, I believe the Dutch found a way to get into uh, mainland China, but um, initially it was via Okinawa, uh, via the Rukyu people. So, um, so you might wonder why I was, went on that rant, because, well, this is where the lions came from, the Shisa. So that influence, you'll see the, the, the Chinese lions everywhere in China. Um, uh, so for the same purpose, one, to uh, guard and fight off evil spirits and another one to protect um, and, and keep good, good energies and good spirits in. Um, so to defend. So one to attack and one to defend. Um, very interesting. So uh, the Chinese influence, even to the point where the, the stones, when they were, came from the airport and the cab driver um, clarified what these stones were at the end of intersections and T-junctions, um, these stones with, with three characters, um, uh, or with the characters that, that signify Ishiganto, um, uh, these are all um, a part of the Okinawan belief system that uh, we, you know, we've got to do what we can to, uh, to, to expel or to deal with the evil spirits that are constantly around us. So the Ishiganto was in fact a, a Chinese general who, um, who became very competent um, and he was on behalf of a god, he was, he was dealing with, with some evil spirits, demons, and he was able to deal with them. And um, so much so that he became a powerful figure or someone that people believed in, in the Rukyu Islands, hence the Ishiganto Stones. Um, so, so that Chinese influence was just prevalent. It was absolutely everywhere. Um, so what you'll find is um, the influence from China um, didn't quite make its way all the way through to, to the Japan that we tend to know about, but it definitely found its way into Okinawa, and that flowed right through to the martial arts as well, with again the southern Shaolin styles that, um, that heavily influenced the, um, the karate styles of Okinawa. Um, and in addition to that, we then had our young Steve um, uh, just get a sense of those shisa. He felt like they would do something for him. Uh, after getting explained to him about how the, um, uh, those gardens were created, where, uh, where um, a, the smallest shisa managed to kill a dragon, and the dragons were feared. So this, the smallest shisa managed to make a boulder fall down and kill this dragon, which ended up creating those gardens in Okinawa. So the belief system is huge on, um, on all this sort of um, supernatural um, stuff. So Steve felt him. He felt the energy in those lions. 
what's up with Steve? Seriously, this guy, where's he going to end up? Um, he, he then managed to expel the demons out of um, Nakandari Sensei. Um, so pretty awesome stuff. And then there was a clarity of mind with Nakandari Sensei. And there was some genuine communication. Um, what you'll find in some of my research, uh, the name for the sensei, Nakandari, um, you'll find it's an Okinawan name. And there are a lot of names that have subtly changed um, over the last 100 years. And I, I opted for the traditional names. I'm a sucker for that sort of stuff. And these are names that are the real Okinawan names. And over time, just as with the Okinawan language, it is changing. So people are just saying, you know what, we're going to get a job in Tokyo. We don't want to look like village idiots. Not that I'm saying anyone from Okinawa is a village idiot, but we don't want to look like we're from somewhere else. So as a consequence, we'll, let's just tone the name down and make it sound more conventional Japanese. So that's, that's something that, that many uh, people do. Um, it's pretty much the norm. So I've tried to hang on to these old names because, you know, the ones that are teaching karate are, um, in a sense, hanging on to old traditions. A lot of those things don't seem to exist anymore, um, in, in, and certainly not as prevalent. Um, so, so that's what's happened there. Um, we've got a bit of a chapter coming up. Um, we just uh, heard chapter 9, Shisa. And chapter 10 is about to come up and it's called The Cave. We don't like caves. Caves sound scary. So it should be fun. Stay tuned. Thank you for your interest. Keep going. It's going to get crazy very soon. I hope you're enjoying it so far. Please remember to subscribe um, and don't be afraid to buy the book. Uh, thank you again for your interest. I love it. Cheers. Bye-bye. Thank you.